Hello and welcome to Young Turks, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. I'm Shireen Bhan. Well, it is that time of the year when we ring in the festivities and Diwali in particular symbolizes the victory of inner, over inertia and the start of a new cycle with the light of clarity and positivity. It wouldn't be wrong to say the Indian startup ecosystem has rounded off a cycle of its own, hitting the concrete hard from the record-breaking highs of 2021 followed by a bitter correction over the last two years to now finally emerging with a sense of sturdiness and signs of spring. 2024 is set to become the best year for startup IPO since 2021, when Zomato, Paytm, Nike and others raced to the Lal Street as flag bearers. So far this year, we've seen the likes of Ola Electric, First Cry, Digit, Exigo, Unicommerce, Office starting their public market journeys. More are on the way with Swiggy, Mobiquick, Black Buck and Ecom Express set to get their fireworks going with plans to list before the year closes. Now, if we assess the venture capital funding data for the nine months so far in 2024, it's been better than 2023 with $9 billion having come into the ecosystem, a tad bit more than what the Chinese market has received. This as per data from Traction. We've seen six unicorns take flight in 2024 compared to just two last year and that's come on the back of large deals returning with as many as 12 funding rounds valued at more than $100 million each. Besides the big highlight of Zepto's $1 billion fundraise in 2024, it's the secondary share sales that have fueled $100 million rounds in the Indian startup ecosystem. The strong IPO lineup and the emergence of secondaries have offered much needed mode of exit for early investors, challenging the long held notion of Indian startups being trapdoors for funders. Sectorally, the AI hype is flat boarding. India's quick commerce players have turned into global outliers, albeit with some regulatory noise that has also plagued the fintech sector. So what does 2025 have in store for India's startups? Before I get into that, let me start by wishing all our viewers a very happy Diwali. And it's time now to welcome our guests on the show, Karthik Reddy, the co-founder and partner of Bloom Ventures, and Hemant Mahapatra, the partner at Lightspeed India. Karthik and Hemant, thanks very much for joining us on this special edition of Young Turks. A very happy Diwali in advance to the two of you as well. Uh, Karthik, you know, I, I gave a very brief but a quick snapshot of what the year has held out as far as India's startup ecosystem is concerned. Let's dive deeper into some of those headlines. What to your mind, Karthik, and I'll start with you, has been the biggest takeaway of 2024 for India's startup so far? I think um, definitely the path to liquidity cycles um, being, you know, predominantly uh, the IPO sort of, uh, you know, journey and the route has become very clear that India will have to pursue that. If you have a domestic company that's actually trying to build value within the boundaries of this country, eventually, whether someone's acquiring it, someone's trying to buy a secondary in a unicorn, or whether someone actually thinks this is a sustainable business, they all approximately look the same. You know, If you ask a private equity player to come and buy into a large digital company, they want to know whether it makes money, whether it's going to get to EBITDA, not right away, but in two, three years. And I think they were more adventurous in 21, 22. They've gone back into the same mode of judging a company as if it were IPO ready. And so I think the, the learning for at least the Indian lot that we, where we're building for the market opportunity that is India is that you have to build within the constraints of what the profit pool in India demonstrates. And then the you're judged by the public markets relative to what else is out there? So if you're Mama Earth, then it's you know Unilever and Marico. If it is uh, you know Paytm, then it is a, an NBFC or a bank, and so on and so forth. So I think it's great that we have that momentum now building up. If we end the year with 12 to 15 IPOs, and we can keep this momentum going for the rest of the decade, suddenly we'll have 100 plus companies listed across small, mid, and large cap in Indian tech. And I think that will be a watershed moment to welcome the next decade. I know I'm talking very far out, but I feel what we started this year is <laughs> it's going to become a consistent trend line over the rest of the decade. Hemant, let me let me ask you, you know, to, to uh, Karthik's point, what would you uh, signify as the big takeaway for the Indian startup ecosystem in 2024 outside of the fact that we've seen the spate of IPOs? And I, I, I think it would have been unimaginable even a couple of years ago that India would have been the IPO nation versus the US market, for instance. Yeah. And absolutely. Thank you again for having me here, Shireen. And good to see you, Karthik. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, look, I, I think I think Karthik is absolutely right. Uh, when capital was easy to raise, um, 
uh, and easy to deploy. Uh, you know, there was a glut of capital uh, around the world. Now that it is harder to raise capital and deploy capital, there's a flight to quality in all dimensions of our business. There's a flight to quality in businesses and business models, teams, and even investors. So we are seeing that happen across all the geographies Lightspeed operates in. Uh, so that uh, so that is a theme you're seeing in the capital markets globally. From a from a thematic perspective, and I would say you know AI is looming large in every single category out there. We are seeing AI um, leading to a resurgence of consumer uh, tech, uh, and I know consumer tech has gone through a bunch of ups and downs over the last few years. But now there is a a wave of new consumer tech companies, new modalities, new behaviors that AI is enabling, that is making it a very interesting category for us to uh, for us to invest in. We've done a bunch of those this year. We're also seeing a resurgence of uh, hard to build uh, companies, hard to build technologies, and uh, you can call it deep tech. Uh, you can call it frontier tech. Um, you can call it infrastructure tech and software. But we are starting to see um, a, a, a lot of a lot of net new companies coming up and attracting a lot of high quality capital that are building hard to solve problems. Um, globally, especially coming out of India as well, which is a net new thing for us and is a theme that we are digging in um, uh, a lot more now. Give us examples of the kind kinds of companies that you've invested in and what those check sizes look like at this point in time. Yeah, so uh, you know, as a fund, we have been pretty active uh, in what you could call frontier tech and deep tech. But maybe just zooming out from there, there are companies that are hard to build in different ways. We are investors in a company called Zepto um, that is hard to build in a very different operationally intensive way and requires a lot of capital to prove a business model out. Uh, and then they have, they have companies like Pixel Space that needs to get down, heads down for three to four years in the lab and prove the, prove the science and the engineering risk behind their, uh, their, uh, uh, their approach before they come out in the market to raise more and more money. So we have looked at both of these categories mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, like I said before, the the capital is now flying towards companies that have um, that have built businesses of high quality, whether they are operationally intensive and require a ton of capital to prove the business model out. Uh, they are attracting a lot more capital now once they have gone through that needle hole. And companies like Pixel Space uh, that have actually spent three to four years building world class, uh, de novo, net new to the world technologies, and now they are kind of reaching commercialization stage. They've also gone out and raised a lot of capital globally. Um, so we are seeing a bit of both happen in, our, uh, in, the, in the India market. Uh, that's been the story. But Karthik, let's just pick up on this quick commerce story because we spoke about this, uh, including at the India Business Leader Awards jury, which you were a part of. Uh, and the point is not just that these are companies that are trying to do something that's hard to build. Uh, the disruption that these companies are creating across different sectors, the fulfillment expectation that these companies have managed to change, whether it's Zepto or Blinkit, uh, and now more and more companies are getting into the fray. Do you believe that this quick commerce story is going to be the clear India outlier for the next decade? I think it definitely rewrites a lot of rules, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, our uh, early pick in the space, Dunzo, got became a victim of this, like, you know, little bit of a capital bloodbath and, and fell behind, uh, sadly. But, you know, we were believers that the delivery model required disruption and it required rethinking in a market like India. Where the 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 you don't have big format big, big format retail like you did in other markets, and you have high density in almost you know 20, 30, 40, 50 cities, and which is where the biggest part of Indian consumption is concentrated. It's not. By the way, we are also contrarians. We in the sense that we don't think quick commerce, for example, will work in tier three, tier four India, and we actually have three to four mm. retail or supply chain bets into th tier three, tier four, which we started two to three years back. So we're always, you know, as as guys who do early stage, we have to be ahead of the frontier. I'm commenting on something that all of you yeah. are aware of now when it comes to quick commerce. What I'm seeing, though, to your point, is it is forcing both D2C brands, conventional retail, conventional FMCG, to mm -hmm. rethink business models. And then every time that happens, just as AI is doing in the polar extreme of technology, this is more around logistics yeah. and supply chain, it's forcing people to rethink how to rebuild supply chains. And if you actually build a picks and shovels business that fuels you know, an acceleration to this business model, 
you could build a very, very valuable company. So now we're seeing plans around, mm. you know, dark warehouses on the cloud. We're seeing, you know, how, how do you get, yeah. uh, we are beneficiaries by way of Yulu and Battery Smart, which are actually supply to, uh, to the quick commerce model. So you, the picks and shovels businesses yeah. are beginning to pick right? Uh, the logistics businesses have to be rewritten. I don't know what delivery will do, and I don't know what Ecom Express will do to be able to, uh, you know, mm. shift their model to be able to compete with these guys. Similarly, as you're seeing, Flipkart and Big Basket are all forced to compete. Let's see if Reliance and DMART also get mm. into that. Twenty twenty four has been an interesting year for the rise of new venture capital in India. Would you would you say that? I think it's a it's a it's a year where things are stabilizing a bit. I wouldn't say we've added too much. I think the additions happened um, over the next, over the last two three four years. So we've had an explosion in new managers uh, who, you, as you rightly said, raised predominantly from India, and uh, it's a surprising trend because Indian you know, investors stayed away from very long-term locked-up capital, which is what venture capital is, right? Somewhere in the mid uh, middle part of the last decade, I think the appetite was beginning to get wetted, given the headlines were like, you know, Tiger's made so much money, or SoftBank has made so much money of some of our biggest unicorns, and we actually, they don't get a slice of it at all, right? But the, the if, from what I recall, AI regulations came in 2012, which made it, it's a little more streamlined to raise uh, from domestic uh, pools of capital. And what got raised between 2012 and 18, Shireen, I think between 18 and 22, there was 10x more capital coming from domestic shows. Mm. Right? That's what we yeah. heard in IBCA. So what it meant is that there's a lot more appetite to take that risk. I would actually argue to mm. the contrary that it, it's actually slowed down a little. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Playing okay. blind into a, into a capital pool that's a venture fund is less appealing than playing directly into companies. So if you saw today, Zepto, mm -hmm. for regulatory or other reasons, is able to tap into Indian family offices for direct investing. So is ACCO, yeah. right? These are the headlines in the last two days, right? De Zepto and ACCO are able to yeah. tap into large Indian family offices. And I think Indian family offices are getting savvy. If There was another article or somewhere mm -hmm. that I read about the quality of talent that's going up in Indian family offices. So you're suddenly building Indian mm -hmm. family offices becoming as professional as venture funds suddenly. Because they're taking direct exposure, right? So we have, we might be writing yeah. 10, 50 crore checks to start a relationship. They're writing 100 crore checks into a single investment, yeah. right? So, so they are becoming sort of mid-market P slash pre-IPO kind of investors, if not classic venture investors. Uh -huh. And it's wonderful to see the spectrum of risk evolve in India. And I don't think it'll be one size fits all. Yeah. I think a lot of their investing into yeah. funds like us is more experimental. They're buying pipeline to understand the market better, right. to be to look at what's coming down the pipe, understand trends. They all come very attentively mm. to our AGMs. They hear what's going on. <laughs> and then they want to play the best of those companies as, they, as they're breaking out. And they're getting close to public when actually, ironically, most of the funds want to exit. And you know, Indian investors are saying, it's our market. This is a company that can grow 10x like yeah. a Zomat. I'll buy into it now, <laughs> right? And so uh, they're yeah. getting sad. And, and it's good to see this. It's good to see this because that you can't rely on SoftBank and 10 other SoftBanks to buy out all our late stage risk. Uh, it's a path to public risk, which only the Indian domestic capital should, you know, sort of anchor. And that's happening a lot more, I think. Well, Hemant, what's your thought on, on the anchor that has emerged in the Indian startup ecosystem driven by domestic capital? I mean, look, I mean, one of the, one of the biggest beneficiary is the IPO market. Uh, Right, so uh, it used to be that majority of the capital going into public markets in India was foreign. Uh, now it is well balanced, and you know, actually, at some point in time, it was actually much higher on the domestic side. And uh, and what is really exciting for us is that the uh, while of course the valuations may be a bit inflated compared to our peers in the same category in the U.S. and other European markets, we do think the 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 uh, the the uh, the potential for upside in India is just so much higher. The internet penetration is still fairly low. Um, you know, e-commerce penetration is still fairly low. Wealth tech, uh, health tech, uh, you know, insurance, all of these things are still very, very nascent in India, which is which is the reason why these uh, these uh, multiples are much higher, sometimes two to three x higher for the same category in India versus in the U.S. The other thing I'll add is, uh, I think I think uh, India is an attractive destination because 
as, as we saw with unicommerce, even small to mid-sized IPOs are getting a lot of attention. Mm. It is very hard for some of mm. these companies to provide liquidity to their investors uh, in, in other markets, especially US and Europe. In the US, you've got to get to about half a billion dollars um, of revenue to even be noticed by, uh, by the ones that mm. build their IPO book. Uh, but I think India market in IPO is where the US market was probably in the 80s or the 90s. Uh, if it's mm. just an example, like Amazon, when they IPO'd in 96 or 97, I think they had about $15 million of revenue and they had no profit. I mean, they didn't have profit for many, many years after that. Uh, mm. Netscape that IPO'd in 95 was $11, $12 million in profit, sorry, in revenue and zero profit. They IPO'd uh, at that stage. And then when you do, when you, when you allow these kind of companies to healthily IPO at the right valuation, a lot of the mm. benefit goes back to public market investors, which are primarily retail over time. So I think it's a really good trend that we are seeing continues. Well, Karthik, one of the concerns though, and I, I don't want to generalize this because these are specific events and specific incidents involving specific companies and specific investors, but that has been the sort of dark cloud hanging over the Indian startup ecosystem through 2023 and 2024, and especially when you have what you would have thought were, uh, you know, the poster child, uh, the poster uh, sort of, uh, you know, boys of this space, uh, face the kind of music that they are facing today and uh, virtually in an existential crisis, it does put to question uh, the governance metrics uh, that people are operating with. How much of that is a concern today and how much of it is being acknowledged uh, and being worked on in terms of cost correction? Karthik. I think the, uh, I think it's a, it's a kind of, um, I would say those cases that you talk about have, are itself nuanced and layered. So outright bad behavior in terms of, you know, punishable offenses, I think are a very small number, Shireen, right? Uh, the second is a little bit more rampant, I would say, which is, um, do they know how to manage their capital, their runway in a down market when capital is tight? Can they control costs? Can they turn profitable? I don't think that is as much as governance as exuberance that has to be curtailed. And if somebody didn't do it on time, companies have blown up as well. Uh, it's happened all through the history of venture. It's not unique. It's just that nobody had seen a correction and cycle in this particular bull market for like post GFC in venture, right? And it peaked uh, 14 years in as opposed to usual seven, eight year cycles. So I think it got a little out of hand. Mm. But when you look at even those collectively put together, um, there's, there's not probably more than 20, 30% of startups which are in trouble. Yes, you might say it's a large number, but you'll see that even in stock market downturns, yeah. usually. So I don't think it's mm. fair to uh, not compare it with what would have happened in a public market downturn, necessarily. That's one. The second, and that's why you have bankruptcies. They happen in the US, they happen here, chapter yeah. 11 because of that. Yeah. Now, the other, there's another 25, 30, 40 percent, including companies in each one of our portfolios in venture, where I think the founders have been smart that to acknowledge that they got lucky with a lot of money in 2021, 22, corrected, course mm. corrected in time, will not maybe hold a candle to the valuations from 21, 22. And if you know, if you realized yeah. First Cry and some of these folks, they, they all digit, they all listed at down rounds, right? So they, I think there's an acknowledgement that this is not a one way street to go up. Markets will correct. And you have to correct your valuation and your inherent value expectations that you set with your investors to more realistic levels. Hmm. And you can't wink the public markets and private markets are absent at those levels any which way. So I think hmm. most of them who want to believe that they're building for 10 more years, 15 more years, and they're building sustainably, have done a great job of course correction, I would argue. And then, you know, the last 30, 40 percent actually, are actually doing well. The numbers are like 2x, 3x from where they were two, three years yeah. ago. And they're riding. So I think it's a yeah. it's a mixed bag. And you're absolutely right. You can't generalize. What you should be yeah. worried about is, have we finished the cleansing? And I thought it'll be done by 24 mm. end, if you ask me. I think it's still a year, year and a half, mm. right? I said that last year. A year, year and a half. Else, but it's it, it's still going to take 12 to 18 months to fully cleanse. It's not done yet. It's not done yet. Heyman, do you agree that the cleansing is not done yet? And as Karthik pointed out, I mean, you know, you've, you've got some of your own portfolio companies that are going through uh, difficult times at this point. Uh, uh, you know, on, on, on the resetting of expectations, on the recalibration of, uh, uh, of valuations and the cleansing that Karthik spoke of, where are we today and how much 
further do you believe uh, we need to be in order for us to be able to get that reset? Yeah, let me, uh, let me add a few thoughts, because I generally broadly agree with Karthik as well. Um, but when there, is, when, when there is a glut of capital, uh, you know, it does affect, money does affect behaviors. Um, so uh, we, we've seen that happen over the last couple of years, and we certainly are seeing correction in the market. What is, what is true now, which wasn't true a couple of years ago, is that having a down or a flat round used to be a ding on your resume. That is no longer a ding on the resume. Mm which is making a lot of these conversations easier for the boards to happen, uh, for new investors to look at a company and think about, well, why is this company raising a down round? It used to be a negative uh, uh, chatter in their heads. Now it's no longer that case. Mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what, what this new uh, wave or the post Zorpira wave is bringing full center uh, and attention is that a company's primary job to exist and reason to exist is to solve a problem that a consumer will pay money for. Mm. And uh, for better or worse, uh, when capital was freely available, that had become the primary job of the, of the founder to go raise as much capital as easily yeah. as possible. And then that did lead to bad behavior, uh, lead to defocusing of the business. It did lead to overspending mm. in an inefficient manner in many ways. I think all that attention is not going to coming back to, well, what is the core reason for my business to exist? And in some cases, the business does not need mm. to exist. We've had those companies shut down as well, where they were scaling and flying quite high during the pandemic. And post-pandemic, behavior yeah. shifted back. Uh, and they don't need to exist anymore. So they had to return capital. And this was a collaborative discussion between us, the mm. board members, and the founders. So we've seen all of this happen. Uh, it's hard to really call whether it's going to take another 18 months or not. Uh, but I certainly see the, the, the trend lines are, are, are positive, And we are seeing a lot of that cleanup already happening across the portfolio that we have and also a portfolio that we see. Uh, as net new investors in uh, other people's companies. Well, it is the season uh, for hope uh, and optimism. So let, let me end by asking the two of you, and Karthik, I'll start with you. Uh, uh, you know, what gives you the most hope as we look at 2025? And uh, uh, where would you place uh, your, your biggest bet on? Uh, you know, is there a sector? Is there a company? What do you feel most confident of in 2025? Me, the theme... Uh... All, all year, we have like an annual theme, and it's been about doubling down around our, our right to win uh, globally as Indian startups, right? And historically, that was understood to be the domain of just software companies, and we actually think that's changing. Uh, we actually think we can win on hardware, we can win on hard tech, uh, agri-robotics. We are co-investors with Hemant and Pixel. Uh, we're seeing the courage of founders who are now exposed to things that we never were at their age, uh, to say that, what, why stop at Indian boundaries? So I feel like, you know, in the future, 40, 50 percent, and that's when you ask me, what am I looking at? If we raise a new fund next year, it's going to be indexed a little higher on our ability to win in global markets, which means we're chasing global revenue mm. pools. And I think it's, you know, that the whole semiconductor question you asked about, if we have supply chains now to oh. deliver the, you know, the, the cheapest raw material for what is required to compete in the future, then we'll be even more equipped to go and win against the world. I won't fund semiconductor like chip, you know, fab units, but everything that leeches off that, I, I want to be a party of, right? Yeah. To build for the world. So that's that's <laughs> my hope that we we actually have uh, stellar outcomes in across consumer health, consumer education, uh, mm. uh, deep uh, tech problems like space, uh, agri agriculture, where we can service the world over yeah. the next dec decade and a half. So right to win in global markets, that's the big theme that continues to dominate uh, uh, Karthik's uh, playbook for 2025. Hemant, what about you? Yeah, I think we are, as investors, we are at a very, very lucky point in time in the evolution of technology. Uh, every 10 to 15 years, a new wave reaches a, an inflection point. And those who enter, that, enter the world of investing and founding companies at the beginning of that wave when, the, when they come out 10, 15 years later, a zero gets added to the outcome sizes, uh, a zero gets added to the uh, revenues that they are able to build, a zero gets added to the number of people that can be, uh, uh, that can be serviced through the technology. This happened in the 90s with internet, happened in the 2010s with mobile, and now it is happening with AI. And we believe that, you know, people say, hey, what is your AI investment? We don't think of it like that. We think it's, it's the, the, the question is as moot as asking, what is your internet investment? Uh, there is no such thing as AI. Uh, it will permeate and 
and and and absorb every little thing that humans uh, are going to do over the next 10 to 20 years, maybe even more. So what is exciting for us, there is a new technology wave that has reached an inflection point, but it is starting to look very hard to differentiate that from magic. And that will lead to new behaviors, new human population scale behaviors across consumer, across uh, uh, you know, uh, enterprise, across deep tech. Even, even hard to do things are going to be possible where you could, uh, you, could, you could deploy AI to design new uh, chemistries for us, new materials for us. Uh, and so on and so forth. So it's like it's like a smorgasbord of interesting stuff that we can look at globally uh, and invest behind. <laughs> so it's a really good space for us. Well, uh, Hemant and Karthik, many, many thanks for joining us on this uh, Diwali special here on Young Turk to take us through the interesting intersections that you're going to be playing on and what you're watching out for in 2025. Always a pleasure wishing you, your families and your teams the very, very best from all of us here on the Young Turks team. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this special edition of Young Turks from all of us. Here's wishing our viewers a very happy, safe and prosperous Diwali. Thanks for watching.